I remember exactly when I said, this is what I want to do. And it was watching you say bullet run the 100. That's when I was like, oh, I really want to do this. Like, yeah. this is what I want to do. And I landed this air and I won nationals. And I feel like for me, that was a moment where it was like, I started my impossible because I think a lot of people just thought girls don't do that. It's impossible for them or it's not, it's not normal for them to do that. And I was like, no, I'm going to go do it. I know I can do it. I can make anything possible. Hey guys, what's up? I'm Tyler. And I'm Kelsey. And we're back with part two of our sit downs with Team Toyota athletes. Last episode, we talked to swimmer Simone Manuel and skateboarder Jordan Baird. And they were represented for all the ladies out there. That's right. So today we've got two more Team Toyota athletes on the show. We wanted to talk to our new Team Toyota additions to get to know them ourselves and let you guys get to know them as they prepare for the Olympic and Paralympic Games Tokyo 2020. I'm just trying to make it on time to work every day. And these ladies are like <laughs> killing the game. And gentlemen. Right? And these two guests are killing it out there in the qualifying round. They're starting their impossible. They're making moves. So first, we have Michael Norman hoping to do Tokyo next year to compete in track and field. And if you recognize Allison Powell's voice from season one, it's because she filled in for us on some of these interviews. Tell us what events you competed. Currently, I'm competing in the 200 and 400, but uh, maybe later in my uh, career, I'm hoping to move down to the 100. We'll see how that goes. So growing up, like when did you start running? Uh, 2009. So I was in fifth grade. Oh, it was okay. like, it's kind of like, yeah, it was, it was random. My dad just kind of like asked me, hey, mm -hmm. you want to try out for track? I was like, sure. <laughs> and then I think I, I remember, I think I ran in some Converse in some like regular shorts. Like I didn't, I didn't have any like running stuff. <laughs> no I was special like, running shoes. Yeah, no, I, I played basketball before this, but or before track. So I had nothing. I just came out there, practiced, mm -hmm. met the coach, stuff like that. Had like one little race. And then I was like, he asked me like, you want to do this again? I was like, sure. And yeah. kind of just like stuck with it ever since my first meet. I think that's uh -huh. what really, really made me like stay. And when was it obvious you're fast? That's, that's tough. That is tough. I would say like my first year of track, I was relatively good. My first race ever, I got second place. So I, I remember that. And I think that kind of like sparked my interest. Like I really like competing. I like mm -hmm. the atmosphere. It's just a, a great sport. It's all about me versus them. So <laughs> that's what piqued my interest. But I think when I really realized that like, oh, you know, maybe I can go to college for this or maybe I can run freshman. It was probably like the end of my junior year of high school. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, things are starting to like turn around. Things are getting like really good and I'm progressing like in ways that I would have never imagined. And I think, you know, that's what really like fueled my motivation even mm -hmm. more to continue working because um, believe it or not, like I had a rough patch in my time of my life where track was just tough. Like I almost quit. So my first year, I was great year, you know, mm -hmm. first, seconds, you know, ran, running fast, you know, beating the majority of the people. Right. But then like, you know, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, you know, I'm this small, skinny guy. Everybody started like lifting weights, going through puberty, getting tall, <laughs> you know, I'm just staying small. I'm just like, wow, kind of sucks. Yeah. And like, um, I'm, you know, I'm running the same times, like 12-8, 12-8, 12-5, 12-2, 12-2, 56, 57, 58, like for the 400. And, you know, things just weren't getting like, I just wasn't progressing the way like uh, I saw my friends progressing. I was, you know, the people who I used to be started beating me. And it was just like, right. it, it just took a lot out of me. And it's just like, is this something that I'm actually good at? Like, do I want to do this? You know, I stuck it out because I had a lot of friends that ran track and, and right. I, just, I just like being around my friends. But, you know, overall, it was just, it was just a tough time for me. And then just like that freshman year of high school, things just started to click and work mm -hmm. again. I just grew a lot, right. probably like four or five inches. Uh -huh. And I started lifting weights. So I started right. getting a little swole. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I was joking, not about, not really swole, but uh, <laughs> I was really skinny my freshman year. But, um, you know, my times were just dropping dramatically. So yeah. I think that's really motivated me to work even harder and continue where I was doing so. You know, sometimes a lot of people get into sports because they're just natural born athletes and they're just good at it. But then when you pair that natural born athleticism with hard work, you know, training and committing to it, then that's kind of the perfect storm, right? That's what creates Olympic athletes. So yeah. do you think that it was just your nat natural born athleticism or was it that you decided, this is something I want to do. I'm going to be better than these people. I'm doing it. <laughs> uh, I think I had uh, some natural born athleticism okay. growing growing up. Um, that's what like started me in track. But I remember exactly when I said, this is what I want to do. And it was watching Usain Bolt run the 100, um, <laughs> like at Beijing, 2008. Just, I, that's why I saw him... Uh, or, you know, the side camera yeah. panning across the hundred 
as he runs across, like that's when I was like, oh, I really want to do this. Like yeah. this is what I want to do. Goals. Yeah. So. Right? So what does the next year look like for you? It's an extremely short amount of, of time for training. So yeah. what does what does the next year entail? So the next year, um, so this is my rookie year running professionally for tra- mm-hmm. uh, track and field. So this year is a world championship year in Doha. So this year we're really going to focus on, you know, again, creating those good habits on the track and um, in life just to carry over to 2020. So mm-hmm. we get as, as we prepare for 2020. But this year, I'm really just going for um, world championship, mm-hmm. going to medal, um, you know, just run really fast and just really enjoy this mm-hmm. lifestyle and graduate. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, bigger yeah. milestone. Yeah, what, definitely huge milestone. What is your What is your typical training schedule like? How much How much are you training per week? I'd say I probably spend about five or six hours a day just strictly on track. Maybe except for like Sunday or Thursday. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it just depends. Uh, practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and sometimes Saturday. Mm-hmm. So training training schedule is pretty rigorous, but you know I love what I do. So yeah. I enjoy every moment of it. You know, some of the stuff becomes tedious, but it's what you need to do to become you know the greatest person you can be. Right. And after you graduate, is it going to be full time on uh, preparing for the Olympics, or do you have to get a job? Uh, no, I'm just straight, strictly just running track. <laughs> this is your just job. Training. This yeah, is your running job. track is my job. So lifting weights, drinking water, stretching, that is all part of the job. So it's a, it's a 24 hour or 24 7 job. Uh, you know, I'm prepared for it and I'm really looking forward to it because school, it's been tough. It's been, yeah. it's been challenging balancing school and track. So um, I think next year will be uh, just an amazing year because I get all the time that I spent in the classroom, that's just added time I could spend on perfecting my craft. Kelsey. Yeah. Imagine just graduating college and training for the Olympics from nine to five every day. I can honestly say when I graduated college, I was not training for much of anything. What were you doing from nine to five? I worked at a tanning bed. (laughs) (laughs) Please don't go to the tanning bed. Yes. Please. Skincare first, everybody. (laughs) This is why Team Toyota athletes are so inspiring. Okay. Seriously, though, I think Michael told us his first car was a Mercedes. I guess we won't hold him against him. He's driving a sweet RAV4 hybrid now. That's right. Speaking of our favorite environmentalists, our next athlete is Lakey Peterson, who is going for the gold in surfing, which is brand new to the Olympic Games and Team Toyota. Take a listen. We're with Lakey Peterson, Mm -hmm. one of the leading female surfers. And she in the a, world, in the world, she is a hopeful for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, and she is one of our wonderful Team USA, Team Toyota members. Yes, that's me. Is it the first year for surfing to be in the Olympics? This is yeah. So it's, Tokyo will be our debut for surfing on the world stage. What kind of waves can you rip? In, in <laughs> Tokyo? This, is, this is our question. Is <laughs> yeah. Tokyo, to me, I'm from Southern California. I don't sure. know about the, the waves in Japan. How can they be sure the waves will be excellent that day? That's a great question. And there was a lot of debate before this Olympics. I mean, once surfing got accepted into it, I think they were, there was a lot of back and forth if they wanted to have it in a wave pool because now wave pool technologies are so amazing mm-hmm. or in the ocean. And there is, there has been some previous pro events actually in Japan, just outside kind of the city and obviously not downtown Tokyo. Right, right. <laughs> We're not shredding, but, but there has been events there and um, it can get really fun. That time of year, like when the Olympics falls is not super duper ideal, I don't think, for waves, but there are, there are fun waves. I actually just was at a surfing USA kind of meeting the other week and they they gave us a rundown of like the probability af- of looking at stats over the last kind of 10 years of what we'll get for the Olympics and we should get some little waves. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. All right. Yeah. You started surfing at a very young age. Yeah. Because you had a parent who was in to swimming. Yes. Yes, I did. National champion. Yeah. Yep. World record holder. Yes. She and- made the Olympics. <laughs> the year it got boycott actually. My mom. And so how did she take you and be like, all right, surfing, this is the thing? Or was that you as a child? You just kind of ran towards the ocean and that happened? Yeah, I think maybe a bit of both. I mean, I grew up in Santa Barbara, California. So Mm -hmm. I grew up near the water and ocean and going to the beach is such a normal thing um, in a place like that. So I feel like that sort of going to the beach and being in the ocean, kind of being a water baby because my mom got me swimming so young 
was pretty natural. Yeah, I don't know. It just sort of came really naturally for me and I loved it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are judges looking for? Like, how is the sport ranked, pointed, scored? Scored. Scored. (laughs) Great question. So we're pretty much judged on a scale of 0 to 10, Mm -hmm. 10 being the best. 0.01 0.01 being the worst. A lot of it, you know, every day that we surf, every venue we go to, the waves are different, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I think a lot of the criteria is dependent on how that day is looking. If, it, if we get a day that's really pumping perfect surf, the expectation of doing big maneuvers and having speed and power and flow, it's kind of what they go off of is going to mm-hmm. be pretty high because we have great waves to perform on. Whereas if we show up and we have to run, but it's pretty small and tricky, you know, maybe one big maneuver is going to get a, a nice big score. Mm-hmm. Um, and if a day is really good, it's probably not going to score the well. So they're they're mostly looking though at, yeah, your speed, your power, and your flow mm-hmm. on the wave. Do you have a signature maneuver? I, I've always tried to be pretty progressive on the, on the female side of things. So I always have tried to do sort of aerial maneuvers and stuff like that, which for girls is not as common that you see, I guess. Mm-hmm. So... I might be known for that a little bit, but I don't, I don't know. That's so fascinating. And so being a first Olympic time sport now, how has this been progressing? How long has this been going on to become an Olympic sport? It's so crazy. I didn't think I would, I would see it in my career time. Of really? Surfing. Yeah, I, I did not think. And I, when I was really young and little, I always dreamt of going to the Olympics and something that was my thing. Because yeah. my mom... Didn't get to go, but made the team. And I was always like, I'm going to go. That'll be so cool. Mm-hmm. Once it was sort of starting to be like, oh, whoa, we might actually get Tokyo. You know, we there was starting to be rumors. And I was like, wow, no, but everyone's saying it will. But I didn't want to get my hopes up. So it's just amazing that we've come so far with the sport. And I think surfing has this reputation of sort of really relaxed beach bum you right. know, like yeah. people, which in a way is is true. We're pretty soulful and love the ocean. But it's also, I'm really excited for it to be in the Olympics and be taken seriously as a sport because everyone on the world tour that I compete against is taken so seriously. Everyone's mm-hmm. got a trainer. Everyone's got a nutritionist. Everyone's got a physical therapist. It's it's amazing. So I, I think the world uh, is going to really enjoy watching it in mm-hmm. Tokyo. And I know the performances will be incredible. And just as an athlete, it's so fun to be a part of things like this, like Team Toyota, you know, and seeing all these other athletes um, come together. And it's pretty darn inspiring. So I'm thankful for Toyota and this opportunity to be here with with them and um, just sort of experience all of it. It's really cool. And you're very involved in um, organizations that work on keeping the oceans clean. Hmm. Tell us what it means to you. It's very interesting that surfing is now a, an Olympic sport right at a point where there's a lot of attention on oceans, particularly the plastic in oceans and, you know, a lot of the environmentalism around oceans. And tell us about your, some of your involvement in that. I mean, for me, obviously, I'm in the ocean every single day. And yeah. I'm in all the oceans around the world. You know, I kind of experience everywhere. And and so I think it's just a natural thing for me to really have a heart for our oceans and just our world. It affects what I do. I mean, I've been sick so many times from surfing when the water is dirty or, Mm. you know, whatever in all different areas of the world, you know, it's a global issue. It's not one person's escape from it or one country's escape from it. So I just think that together we can all, it sort of sounds really cheesy, but I think collectively together we can all really make a difference. And if I can in any way be a voice or an advocate for people to just be more aware of of their plastics use or um, pollution use and little tips and tricks it all really does compound and add up um, to help clean up our oceans. And it's something that we need to start doing before it's not reversible. Has there been anything like you're training, you're in the ocean and like a fish flies out and like hits you? <laughs> like, has there I've been had any- fish hit me. Yeah, yeah, that's happened. They're always like those needle fish, you know, those needle fish that jump. Have oh, you seen I see. those yeah, things? Yeah. I'm always so scared those are going to hit me. I'm like, oh my <laughs> It's because the ocean's so big and there's so many things in it that aren't human. That aren't there's humans. so many like opportunities <laughs> for something to happen. You're talking that about could a really big really fish. funny yeah. or really bad or I mean, I think, yeah, it's part of just being sort of in an action sport and being in a sport yeah. that you're in an environment that's uncontrollable, which is sort of 
I think the fun and the challenge of it a lot, you yeah. know, it's always changing the ocean and the, you can never, it will humble you like that, you mm -hmm. know, like you're never, the moment you think, oh, I'm getting pretty good with big waves or uh, whatever, it just, yeah. you, it will humble you. And I think the challenge of that is really, really cool. You can never fully master what it's going to do or what, what, you know, the wave's going to do. I think that's a continual challenge for for surfers. And I think the greats really have such a great read on on how to like, yeah, just work with the ocean and figure it out and and be adaptable. And in terms of the fish and all the creatures in the in the ocean, I don't know. I love I like love it. It's it's so refreshing to go out in the ocean and whatever, see a dolphin or have a fish jump or I don't know if there's a shark, then just get all the water. <laughs> <laughs> so who's our prime competition? For me? Like what what other countries? Okay. Australia is obviously very, very strong and very, very good. Brazil on the women's side, but really on the men's side. I mean, our world champion right now on the men's side is Brazilian. And they would just got a ton of them that are so, so talented. And also particularly really good in small waves, which is probably what we'll have in Tokyo. Mm. Kind of not too much, like pretty, not a lot of power in the waves and that. So, And they're, they, for some reason, seem to be able to generate so much speed and um, are just really good in those sorts of conditions. So the Brazilians are really good. There's a couple great surfers from Europe. We actually have an event in France and Portugal every yeah, year. Yeah, there's that big waves in Portugal. Yeah, yeah, Nazareth really in waves. Portugal, yeah, mm -hmm. for the big wave world tour. And so, yeah, you get, you get some great people from over in Europe. And then, yeah, but America's going to take the cake. Don't worry. <laughs> so is it to your benefit to catch more waves or wait till it's a good wave that you know you can really shine on? That is super dependent on conditions, but you want to be selective with the wave you go on because we have a thing called priority. So if there's myself and one other girl in the heat, say I catch the first wave when the heat starts, then the girl that's out here and who didn't catch a wave, she, she then has priority over me to go on whatever wave she wants, even if she's not mm. in the best position. So you don't want to just take a wave and give up your priority. If you have priority, you want to select something that's going to give you opportunity because you also are a little bit against the clock, right? I mean, it takes time to paddle back out yeah. and get back out there. So you only have 30 minutes. So you want to kind of be tactical, but you also don't want to just sit and be too selective yeah. and like, well, I didn't make anything happen. So it's a bit of the game. When do trials start? Do you have to qualify as mm -hmm. a new event? And then running up to the Olympics, what does that time frame look for like for you? How soon are you going to get to Tokyo? Should you qualify? <laughs> yeah. So the way our qualification is going to work is we have a world tour, right? Mm -hmm. Which for the women is the top 17 in the world. For the men, it's top 34 in the world. And so within this tour, we have 10 events. And each event, you get points. Mm -hmm. It's the same amount of points for the, all 10 throughout the year. So at the end of the year, you get like a world ranking. And so what they're going to do for the U.S. and Australia, Brazil, they'll take the top two from both the men's and the women's at the end of the year, and that's who's going to make the team. So, the, okay. so they'll take the top two women ranked, yep. and then that will be who qualifies for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. So from there, we'll see what happens. Know, it's my first time doing this so, <laughs> with the Olympics. But, but it's also um, everyone else's first exactly, time doing this. Exactly. So I would imagine actual once the olympics comes around i think you know we'll probably get there pretty early in tokyo mm -hmm. and get settled in and yeah it'd be really fun do you know when we were talking um to simone earlier and she was saying she's like we don't get to go to the opening ceremonies because like literally swimming starts right after mm -hmm. do you know generally when surfing is going to be so they're actually going to give the whole two weeks that the olympics runs um a waiting period for us so that we can choose to run in the best conditions possible. Mm. So you don't run into that rut of like, oh, shoot, we're scheduled to run on the 15th yeah. and it looks really good on the 18th and yeah. flat on the 15th, you know. So it's really great that the IOC is giving us that opportunity to have some, you know, leeway from those two weeks to choose the best conditions. So I don't know when we'll be surfing yet, but... Hopefully it's later. I want to go to the opening ceremonies if I make it. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Yeah. What was your first car and what do you drive now? I drive right now a TRD off-road forerunner. Yes. Which I dig. What color is it? It's white. 
My first car was like a Mini Cooper way back. No, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> which was not We know compatible. there are other brands out there. Yeah, which yeah. was not compatible to surfing. <laughs> and then from there, I went straight to a Tacoma. And I love the Tacoma. Yeah. And then now I got the Forerunner and I'm really pumped on it. That's awesome. Yeah. Start your impossible. That's, you know, our tagline catchphrase. But yeah. it's more than that to us at Toyota. And we often, you know, ask employees to kind of tell us in stories and, and not just stories, but live it too. Yeah. Do you have a story or a moment of how you started your impossible? It's a great question. I think for me, what comes to mind right away is when I was 14 years old, I was competing. I didn't start competing until I was 12, so a mm-hmm. bit later. And so when I was 14, I made this event called the Nationals. And it's just, you got to be like top, pretty highly ranked in the junior. It's for 18 unders. So mm-hmm. I was really young. I was 14. Made the Nationals for this 18 under division, which at that time is like a pretty big deal. It's yeah. Nationals is all the kid, best kids from around the nation. And I made the finals in it. I was sort of not on the scene yet at all. I was mm-hmm. kind of still starting surfing. I guess a bit of a dark horse, if you would say. And yeah. it was at a time where I was like, gosh, no one like believes me right now. Like no one even knows who I am. No one, you know, I, all of a sudden yeah. I even was like, whoa, I made the final in this this national event. And I went out and I was like, I'm going to just try and do an air, which has never been done. was at the time had never been done in a junior event before ever on the women's side. And so I went out and I landed this air and I won nationals. And I feel like for me, that was a moment where it was like, I started my impossible because I think a lot of people just thought girls don't do that. It's impossible for them right. or it's not, it's not normal for them to do that. And I was like, no, I'm going to go do it. I know I can do it. Yeah. I think that was a turning point for me where I, I started my impossible. It was like, no, I can, I can make anything possible. That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. Are you practicing some of these things that haven't been done on the women's side? Like, maybe to use in the Olympics? Obviously, you want to get better at them, but... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, totally. I think I think that's the next step for women surfing is getting girls to be more comfortable with doing airs and being more progressive and kind of going outside those boundaries that people mm-hmm. think they shouldn't go out of. So yeah, it's definitely something that's I practice and is on my mind, 100%. I'm so excited. Yeah. I'm so excited to watch surfing for the first time in the Olympics, oh, but then good. also to see this progressive maneuvers being done. Yeah. All right, everybody, take care of the ocean, please. Yes, we please, please. We want fish to hit lakey and not plastic, yeah. please. <laughs> exactly. All right, thank you so much for joining us on Toyota Untold. Told. This is awesome. Awesome, thanks. I think Lakey is probably one of the cooler people I've met. First of all, I can't surf. I can't. What? I can't do actually any of these things that the athletes can do. So I'm so I mean, glad. you can run like my as well. So I'm so glad you guys got to talk to her. Yeah, she's doing amazing things. She's surfing, she's protecting the ocean. We will be rooting for her and Michael this year for sure. I can't wait. Yeah. And that goes for the entire Team Toyota also. So thanks for joining us on our second episode. This is Kelsey. And Tyler. You can find our guests on Instagram at MichaelNorman22 and at Lakey Peterson. Our show is produced by Sharon Hong and Allison Powell. Music by Wes Meixner. Edited and mastered by Crate Media. Find us on Twitter at Toyota and at Lexus and on Instagram at Toyota USA and at Lexus USA. That's the end of our show. See you in two weeks.